so we start tonight we we welcome Ronen Kadushin here at Yak. It's not uh, his first time first time at Yak and he will be with us today and tomorrow uh, where he will be uh, leading a workshop about uh, the open design concept that he will explain a bit uh, tonight to you. So, uh, Ronen is an Israeli designer and uh, teacher who have been uh, teaching in uh, Israel and Europe uh, since 1993, uh, I guess. You are in Berlin since the 2005 and in 2004 he um, came out with the concept of open design. That is, uh, well, he, the lecture will be uh, about that, so we'll explain it a bit uh, better, but it's about to the possibility to download uh, um, files to produce furniture and uh, object, and, uh, well, I don't say more because <laughs> you are the expert on that. And he also founded the, uh, a company called Open Design in order to uh, produce and sell products uh, that are open design based uh, all over the world. So, up to you. Thanks for coming and uh, welcome to Yak. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> to be close to the. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming and I'd like to thank uh, Sylvia uh, for uh, bringing me here and Anna that uh, dealt with all the details and for Guillaume that, that was, you know, I talked to him a few months ago when I was here, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I see the IAC, you call it? I say IAAC, so IAAC as one of the leading uh, uh, instit institutes that, that uh, are looking to the future. They have something, they, they relate to this uh, direction. And, um, well, you'll see also in the slides there's something that, uh, that is very special for me to stand here and, and talk in this place today. Um, a little introduction about myself. Um, I'm, I'm a designer. I'm, I was taught, uh, I studied design in Israel. I'm a design educator, a teacher for, for many years, like for 21 years now. And the story of open design starts with a, with a disappointment. It starts when somewhere around 2000 I do a collection of furniture and I thought it looked good and I, uh, I went, uh, I published it and I sent it to, to all kinds of companies. I thought they would, we would like to produce it in Milano, in Italy and others. <coughs> About 40 companies. I got uh, maybe three saying no of all these and one saying yes. And the company that said yes to me was, was uh, uh, like a dream for me com coming true, you know, to, to do a product with that company in Milano. And I flew there, we talked, uh, I showed them, we discussed, we started uh, exchanging uh, agreements and so on. And after four months, the guy calls me and says, look, uh, the project is cancelled. And at, at, uh, until this moment, the, the, the sun was, was uh, shining at me, the leaves of the trees were saying hello. I was, I, was, uh, I was floating on air. And after this phone call, when I stopped crying, I started to think uh, about this situation. And the situation was, was, was quite ridiculous, that there is somebody in Milano that controls my life, my career, my creativity, my, um, I mean, everything, uh, my, my mood, you know, and I thought it's unacceptable and I started to look around. I saw I had, I had friends that were musicians or graphic designers uh, and so on and I, I, I see that they, they just do whatever they want and publish it online and, and get, uh, uh, get more acknowledgement and get, you know, work and have this kind of thing. There was a lot of creativity going on at around 2000 in areas that were basically information and and from my point of view uh, I saw myself as an Israeli designer uh, uh, that I need to do something to to join these people I need to to find a way to be uh, creative independent 
producing, selling, so on and so on, without anybody saying no. I mean, I could not accept a, a, a gatekeeper in my life. And I started writing my master's thesis, and, and I call it open design, because I thought it's open design, um, uh, following, let's say, uh, open source software uh, methods and so on. And when I, when I finished my master's degree, it was 2004, being an academic and all, I, I asked myself a question, do you have the balls to, to really do it in the real world? And, and uh, with my wife, who is doing something else, um, we came up with a plan that, yes, I want to do it in the real world, and, and uh, we moved in 2005 to Berlin uh, with our dog, Django. This is Django, if you <laughs> who is the center of my universe, actually. <coughs> but. Um, and since then, I'm doing open design, and, and uh, when it started, for me, when, when I started it, it was a way of free expression, of to be more creative, to be independent, to express whatever I want. But little by little, it became, uh, it, it gathered more context as, as time went by. Let's see if this works. Yes. That's the button. So we'll talk about open design today. And um, this butterfly or whatever it is, it's part of the, the 3D printed gun by Cody Wilson. I just uh, I made it into a nice thing, so I, I needed a, a cover for. Um, I have an issue with design education, uh, a very strong one. And, and uh, it is that, that for many years, or for too many years, there is a way of design education towards, uh, in the, towards being part of an industrial design, or sorry, uh, part of an industrial machine, part of a mass production scenario. Um, design education systems are geared to, to produce graduates that will integrate as good as possible into a mass production scenario. And to do this, they teach this. This is the first, the biggest dogma of industrial design. It's still like main, really mainstream, and where I teach uh, usually now in Germany, it is the way that things are um, and thought about and, and, uh, and valued. There is a designer here that creates a design that is, goes to a producer who makes the product, and the product goes into the market. And when you, when you consider this dogma from the point of view of a designer, then the designer basically is at the, is at the bottom of the, of, the, of the food chain, at the bottom of the hierarchy. And when I was starting to think about open design as a, as a, as a method of creating things, I found that uh, a lot of the resistance to, to this kind of way of thinking came from what I call the church of industrial design. This is the... the um, the design education, uh, factories, uh, design prizes, everything around it was geared to do this thing. And it just, the, there's so much between the designer and the market. There's so much between the designer <coughs> and, his, and his, his, his or her customer. And um, I was starting to, to make a bigger look at it and just look from a, from a, a wider angle. And I, uh, I'm trying to, to understand where it is, what is the context, and, and quite, quite uh, uh, you know, after some time you realize that uh, we are living in a very special time now, uh, where there is a very, I would say, um, very energetic uh, push towards transformation uh, from hierarchy into network. I mean, you're all in it, you, you know what I'm talking about. And the world is no more, uh, not, not so much about the material, but the information, even if it's the information about the material, but we are dealing with information in a network. And the question was, if uh, industrial design was the outcome of the industrial revolution for, and, and went on for 100 years, uh, what is the, let's say, the information revolution reaction to this? Where is industrial design in a networked culture scenario? And my, my answer was that it could be, at least as a, an alternative, open design. And um, I did, I mean, I reduced it to, to as little as possible, so it will not be, not too many details about it. It's just 
what you do, do it as an as a information file. And this information file, the CAD, is on the internet. And anybody can download it and produce it and change it and modify it and, and copy it and so on and so on with Creative Commons license, but, but this was the, the basic of it. And to make it repeatable, industrial, scalable, then it should be done with CNC machines. This is the, the connection to, to the industrial side of the design. So this was basically the vision that if you have a, a designer, he makes, he designs, or she, an open design that at one, goes to a CNC factory of some kind, produces uh, a product that goes into the market, but at the same time, there is a file that is, is going online in the internet. And there, there was, oops, it's not this one, it's this one. And there's a vision in it, what can happen? You know, I, I was thinking, what, what can happen if this is the, the situation? And when you follow what is going on with open source software, with graphics, with, with um, actually anything that is information, I'm talking about uh, 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 remixing and mashing up and everything that, that is connected to handling information happens pretty quickly when it's on a network. And the vision was that through the internet as the medium of communication, there you will have everybody that wants to, to uh, jump in can jump in. It's not a problem. And it will bring together markets and designers and universities and governments and everybody can, can, can have his own version or modification or opinion about any open design that, that there is. So this is, this is a scenario, actually some of it is already happening, you know, uh, I saw cameras uh, to MIT and so, you know, this, this, is, this is part of it, I mean, you cannot, you cannot share anything that is not open, I mean, you don't share pictures, you share files, so this is the big vision. And I thought, what could happen, you know, what, what, is, what is the result of such a move? And, um, it creates a market, it creates uh, um, an equal uh, environment, it's inclusive, it, everybody that wants to go in can go in, can, can have a share. It creates uh, uh, a whole different type of, of, of product uh, that, that, that is not, when you go to the market and buy it, or to a, to a supermarket, I don't know, to the furniture shop and you buy it, this is only an instance when a CAD file is, is just produced and sold, it can, it can create other things, like a, a pool of designs that um, designers put in and uh, producers take from it and create a, create a, a cooperation and so on. So the, 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 it has a lot of implication and, and local. The, the design is, uh, is global, but, but production tends to be local in these things. You produce where it's closer to the consumer. So, to get out of, uh, I mean, just to, to, just to get away a little from, um, from ideas into practice, uh, I, I opened, my, um, I opened uh, my website with downloadable designs, with open designs, and this was the first, the first one I published. This, it's called the Flat Knot Fruitball. And I thought it's uh, simple enough to, uh, to publish. And it had all the characteristics of what an open design is. It is, uh, it is uh, available, it's always available. If, even if I don't have it, if it, if it doesn't exist, then still somebody can download and produce it. That means that, that uh, not only I can have like a large um, portfolio of products that are always available, but in 50 years or 100 years, still they will be produced even with me not being there. Yeah? Or, or, yeah, so it's kind of future ready in this, uh, in this aspect. And when I design an open design, it's, it, it's meant to be an open, open design. It's not that I design something and then say, okay, let's open it. It has to have the, the, the characteristics of being able to be reproduced by CNC machines and so on and so on. And to make it useful, it has to be, in, in my words, it has to be simple. I mean, for me, simple is just this line that you see here. Uh, for you, simple is something that you do in a grasshopper that goes into a rhino that goes into a 3D printer and so on and so on. This is, uh, we have different um, 
perceptions of what is uh, simple. I'm, I'm kind of old school with that. And just to show you what it means, just one moment. People ask what machines you use and so on. No, no, it, I, I, the, the, the thing is, this is sold now. That I, I, I have a distributor in Stuttgart, and now they started selling it in South America, uh, apart from Europe. And it's kind of uh, um, an interesting notion that you, you get like a bunch of these from the laser cutter. And uh, I invite my cleaning lady over for the weekend and I bend it and she puts wrapping on it and we put it on, in boxes and send it and, and in one weekend I make, uh, I make kind of a nice living, you know, not, 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 it doesn't happen a lot and that I'm not getting rich, don't get me wrong here, yeah, but it's, it's kind of an um, extremely thin and simple way of, of, um, of making some money, so this is and quite, quite soon after I publish it, I get an email from um, uh, Osvaldo Melone from Sao Paulo, who said, uh, I, 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 I looked at your uh, candle holder and I did my own variation, and I would like to use your designs as, um, um, I, I would like to sell your designs in a, in a gallery, in a design gallery or a fashion gallery. And the profit, that we gain from the selling of your products will go to finance an education center for street children in Sao Paulo. I, I, would you like that? I said, yes, please do that. This was the, the first commercial, or let's say semi-commercial thing that ever happened with, with my work. And this was kind of a, a signal for the future. This is what can happen. I can make good for, for my, my things. It's not about money so much as about opportunities that open to you when you are open. Um, 2008, I'm telling you stories, then you know it, it will get together and, and I hope you will enjoy yourself. So. 2008, BMW calls me and says, uh, would you like to come over to Munich, to our, to our uh, um, advanced design center, to talk to us about your work? And I said, yes, of course. And, um, um, but I was thinking, what do they think that I know that they do not know? And um, um, they asked me, can you bring samples? I said, yeah, I can bring samples, but uh, you can also download and produce my stuff. Do you have a laser cutter at your factory? I said, yeah, but as a matter of fact, we have. So please download this and this and this, and, and, and we'll work on it. I came there uh, to their advanced design. The advanced design center is the place where they um, start designing a car from a concept to uh, kind of um, a pretty clear, um, um, look, function, um, you know, aesthetically and so on. And actually I don't have any evidence that I was there except this picture. They shoved me into the conference room, I could not uh, take pictures, and I, I took a photograph of this. This is their top 20 cars, if you want to know what BMW considers the top 20 cars in the history of car making, it's this. And 
I asked them, why did you, why did you invite me? I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the reason? And they told me that they have a scenario that they think that in the next years, they don't, they don't know exactly when, but in the next years, there's going to be a crisis that is uh, connected to peak oil. And it will take um, the world about 20 to 25 years to find an alternative energy source and, uh, and the infrastructure to, to distribute it. And in these 20, 25 years, they need to find a way to make cars cheaper. And they told me, we don't know how to make cars cheaper because we were doing the same thing for 100 years, which we don't know. And we looked at your stuff and we, are, you, we realized that one of the best ways to, to lower the price of production is production without tooling. This is what I do. They looked at it as production without tooling. So we were discussing production without tooling. I showed them what I showed you and, and I, they did a, I did a, a big um, object and so on. And my point was, if it's production without tooling, then everybody can do it. I mean, the, 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 the logical thing would be to release your design as an open design and let other people be creative about it, improve it, make variations, make it localized, uh, do research, make, make development and so on and so on. And they were like, interesting. Thank you very much. Kind of uh, interesting idea, but but we will not um, not 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 now. And we shook hands, and I went, and I didn't know what happened. And it, it, everybody enjoyed it. It was a good experience. A year later, I meet uh, Chris Bangle, who was not at that day when I was there. He came the, the next day. He told me, and he was. I introduced myself, he didn't know who I was, and we, he was like, oh, it's you, and so on and so on. So we started talking, and he tells me that they built a car from my ideas. Now, um, I never knew, nobody showed it to me. I still, you know, I, I, I'm dying to see this car. But the fact is that somewhere, the idea of open design was realized as a car. And maybe in the future it will be even like a real car, it will be in the streets. But, but the fact that open design is not only for me as a, as a single designer, independent designer, but it also interests a big company like BMW. A while later I started to think about systems. Because up to that point I was doing uh, you know, like these things that were just singular uh, uh, products and I wanted to do something about a system. How, how can I make a, a shelving system that is big, small, tall, so on and so on. And I came to this idea, the italic shelf, which is only a two-part um, system, um, a shelf and a spacer. And I call this system um, controlled collapse. Uh, because it, it, it kind of it wants to fall, but it doesn't fall. Uh, the more uh, weight you put on it, it makes it becomes um, it becomes harder or more stable, and it's basically extremely easy to to manufacture and and build. And I published it. This is 2008, and I started to get people doing it and sending me pictures of what of what they did. And uh, this one is from Greece. This is. American, this is American, uh, Austrian, German, um, little variations. The, 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 the interesting thing is that I asked them, why didn't you change it? They said, no, we wanted the designer's version of it. It's, it's, uh, even if you put it uh, as an open design with the potential of doing basically whatever you want with it in terms of aesthetics, they chose to make the designer's version of it. Although sometimes even better than my production. I mean, this is a woodworker's work and they did uh, solid wood frames and uh, lacquer and so on and so on, that which I cannot afford uh, to produce. It just makes the product extremely, um, extremely uh, uh, expensive. And this is what I'm saying. You know, at the same time, there is a, there is a course in, in, in this place, which it, it's kind of a, Weird to say this, but but uh, IAAC was the the first uh, place in the world that took seriously what I'm saying, and and uh, uh, Marta Malé, 
was the professor in that course. It's 2009. You you you've been here. You you remember this? Yeah, okay. And and uh, uh, I was astonished. I was uh, the I, I got one day. I get a uh, uh, few um, students asking questions, and after a few months, I get this and other uh, experimentation with my stuff, and, and I'm saying this this is is this is op this is the power of open design. This is what can happen if you do something open. At one point, or when I when I think of it, I'm happy that I have a shelving system but when it goes to the hands of architects it becomes architecture it just grows in scale with the same kind of principles this thing is a church I never thought it had anything to do with religion but somebody else did or for children or or, or whatever it was not the only one this this one also I, I started when I came <coughs> to Germany I started to fold bigger uh, sheets of, of metal this this top table there is uh, from two millimeter stainless steel and it's uh, it's from a meter and a half and meter and a half piece and when you fold it by hand it becomes like a nice dysfunctional coffee table that I have a friend that says this table is good only for snorting uh, lines of coke so this is what it is and and the, the other side of it in this place is producing a shelter for earthquake survivors from Peru. This was the idea. Local materials, local work, uh, quick assembly and so on and so on. So, so in, in uh, the, the range of what a design can be or how it can be applied or why it, 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 it becomes useful, especially when it's simple. When you understand how it works, you can apply it to, every, to, to all kinds of things and all kinds of variations. There were also uh, by, by this place also uh, facades of buildings and uh, a lot of things. It's just uh, an example. And a while later, when I feel more confident with what I'm doing and have kind of a uh, urge to express myself in a, in a kind of a more um, persuading way, I, will, I do the chair. Um, I don't know if you're mostly architects, but I, I, maybe you don't have this thing, but I'm a designer and I have a chair fetish. I mean, um, I love doing chairs. I mean, if, 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 if there's something I love doing, is doing chairs. And um, if a designer makes a chair, it has a statement about aesthetics, about materials, about production, about the culture, society, about what is a human being. Yeah, the chair is a container for, for, for a person. It has, it has a kind of a communication about who is the, the person that is related to this chair. It affects, it affects you physically. You look at this, I mean, this not yet, but you look at, at the chair and, and your body reacts. It's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, object and has uh, something like 4,500 years of recorded history. A chair is... is well, I, I, okay, you, you get the point. <laughs> and I was thinking, what would, be, what would be an open design chair? And, and I started by saying what it will not be. It will not be an IKEA, an IKEA replacement. It will not be about being better or cheaper or more comfortable or anything that you expect from a chair, but it will be my pure creative expression in shape and form and structure in a chair. And, and at that time, I still am, but at that time, I was pretty much starting to get bored with what I saw around me in design. I mean, if, if you compare, if products in the world were playing music, it would be elevator music. And I wanted rock. Okay, I wanted something that would be uh, with an edge, it will be strong, it will, it will make you stop in your, in your place and say, what, the f what, what, what is this? Yeah, what is this? And, and um, so I started to, to think about, you know, uh, forms that are more um, kind of aggressive, uh, make, ask questions, uh, not, not compromise on anything. That if you, <coughs> if you understand what, I mean, you can look at the chair and say, I, I like it, I don't like it. But if you, if you stop and just read what it is about, what is open design, you would say, 
Yeah, I don't like this chair, how it, how it looks, but I like the, the system, that how it looks. I like the, the way it is bent. So I can download it and make it round and make it anything I want. And just to, just to um, I have another um, thing. the company they do one to six scale stuff and sell it for for a lot of money I heard that they make more money uh, selling the scaled chairs like classic chairs than they do selling the chairs themselves so I said okay it could be my own vitra and this is this is basically the same thing this is the hack chair and originally it's from six millimeter aluminium laser cut but this is just for example one to six scale in stainless steel and I, I, I will bend it for you now it takes about 20 seconds more to do the real chair there's a movie in my site or in Vimeo you can watch just a moment I don't mean glass for this but basically you have this thing this thing goes like this goes like this like here and this and this is basically the chair so just to show you that was the first. Uh, uh, this, that was the first. Uh, expressive, uh, in your face, um, with energy, with with a statement that hello, this is open. This is me doing open design, and I'm not like the others. A kind of an individual statement, and. Um, it was all around uh, a technical detail that I kind of mastered in a way. Uh, I call it the twist hinge, and and when you when you create twist hinges in in any thickness of material, you can bend it by hand, and you can make and and the, the nice thing about the twist hinge that when you when you design something on a computer, you know exactly without doing too many manipulations, but you know exactly the center of of uh, rotation. You can you can design on the computer where the thing will be will start and how it will end and why and so on. What's what's the whole procedure of of bending? And this is me bending the whole chair, and this is yeah this is the the detail. <coughs> and when you have this uh, detail on your computer and you figure out the um, configuration on how to make a chair, things be begin to be uh, extremely, I would say, it's energetic. You have all the possibilities at the same time to do whatever you want as a chair or not, but you can do whatever you want. And, and this is just a, a little example of my, of my sketches. And it's, it's not just a research on where will I go, will I do that. It's, it's also like, I can do this and this and this and this and this. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not about getting to a point where you get uh, one final chair, but it's the, it's the situation where you can do exactly as much chairs as, as are on screen here and so on. <coughs> becomes kind of a, I mean, I told you I like to do chairs. I mean, this is only just a, a little example, but it, it begins to, to be fun. It begins, it's so easy that when you stop considering um, um, too much about statics or it's, it's solved already, then you ask yourself, what, what would be the chair? What, what direction will it go? What will be the shape? Well, then, and it becomes like more and more and more and more and more. And then you have to choose, I mean, at the end, I chose six and made an exhibition with it. And this was the recent uploads from the, the end of 2010. And uh, I, I developed three chair configurations and did two, two uh, samples of each configuration. I'll show you the hack chair you saw. Uh, this, this, this is the exhibition version, which is like this. And the graffiti, you know, you go in Berlin, you see a lot of graffiti. It has this kind of uh, uh, aggressiveness, a little energy, kind of a special kind of expression. And I, I was kind of, ah, let's do my own thing. It, it, it's a, a bit like doing a letter, but doing fonts kind of in the design. Um, another configuration, uh, the vague chair doesn't know what it wants, it goes uh, this way, that way, uncomfortable, thinking about something, forgetting in the way. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's somewhere floating in, the, in, the, in, uh, in places where it doesn't know exactly what, what, what it wants. But on the other hand, the simpleton chair, I try very seriously to be a German designer. And uh, from all the chairs of this uh, collection, this is the best seller. I mean, uh, people, uh, Germans like it.
like it. I mean, I don't blame them, but <clears throat> this was when I was kind of, I was doing with my ass, kind of, yeah, let's design something, be German, and they got it. Flatfield is uh, my homage to uh, Rietfeld. It was, uh, I think, I think Rietfeld was one of the most courageous designers ever, and it was my homage to the red and blue from uh, 1917 or 40, I cannot remember right now, or I can't remember. And Tel Aviv, well, it's a city I lived for 14 or 15 years, and, and there's something about Tel Aviv, uh, this messiness, this aggression, this, uh, this pace, that things want to be okay, they want to meet each, each other at a right angle, they want to be organized, but it doesn't work out because it's, it's it's too Tel Aviv, things are just bump into each other and it's too tight and so you have a chair that is feeling uncomfortable with itself, it's not resolved, it's not this, it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, kind of ecstatic about, yeah, I don't know what will happen and so on. So this is the Tel Aviv chair and the exhibition looked like this, this is, this is one in the uh, Apple Design Gallery in Berlin the, the, at the beginning and then uh, Kyoto University did an uh, exhibition about uh, products in a, um, in a, in a digital, digital age and they did three chairs. I mean, I didn't send it to them, I, I didn't, didn't send the chairs, I just downloaded the, the files and produced their own. But I, theirs looks better than I did, yeah, I mean, they, they look better. And um, the, the piece of metal where you take the chair from, the flat part, was part of the exhibition. I mean, it, it's like a complementary uh, to the story of how the chair came to be um, real or how was it b bent and so on. And, and at the exhibition, at the beginning of the exhibition, the opening night, there was nothing, there were no chairs, there were just flat pieces. And each, uh, like if every half an hour, I would go and bend the chair. And then by the end of the exhibition, there was this, the whole collection was, was there. And I mean, I'm not only like this. Uh, this, is, this is a chair I did especially for uh, Vienna Design Week uh, a year and a half ago. And the gallerist uh, there asked me to do something that is related to the history of Vienna. And, and I, I'm a fan, I'm kind of a fan of Art Nouveau. And I thought, yeah, Art Nouveau started in a way in Vienna, but it has a uh, uh, hundred or so years of, of, uh, of, of history. I mean, it had the revival in the 60s, um, kind of a psychedelic approach. It, it, you can see it in Coca-Cola. You can see it, it, it has a lot of references after a hundred years. It, it acquired a lot of information with it. So this is my, my um, take on, on, on Art Nouveau, a flat Nouveau, the chair. And this is the flat one and the, I mean, and it's the same as this. It's the same thing. It's, it's over the same kind of uh, configuration. So I got a bit, uh, I was okay with my chair production and 3D printing came about, 3D printing kind of started to go in uh, more and more into, into my life. I was reading more, getting, um, I was uh, in contact with Fab Labs and uh, hacker spaces and uh, they all had these 3D printing um, machines and you look at Thingiverse and you see just the endless flow of stuff stuff things and my question I, I was I was thinking what can I do with 3d printing I'm not a, I'm not very good in 3d design I'm not good in, in I mean the the, um, the software uh, uh, part of it I'm, I'm kind of I like 2d and then bend it and so on but I was thinking what my question I, I was thinking I was asking myself what would be a critical product that you can design and produce um, as an open design in 3D printing. And I, it took me like two months to, to figure it out. I came across quite, quite, you know, by chance on these things. These are intrauterine devices. Diaf not diaphragm, uh, uh, hmm? Diaf no, diaphragm is, is the round thing. No, th this is, uh, this, this thing, it's a contraceptive. It is, uh, it is, um, 
It is a medical product that goes into the woman's womb and stops uh, and, 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 and prevents pregnancy. And I was thinking, this is, this is a, this, it's, these thing, it's about this size. And I was thinking, yeah, I can, I can 3D print it. So I go, got into a little kind of a, a, a research. And I came up with this. Now this is totally conceptual. This is a design fiction. This does not, it's not a real product. It's a, it's, it's a product about the possibilities of open design. And I'm saying that if a group of women, a group of gynecologists, uh, a pharmaceutical company would come together in an open environment, there is a pretty good chance that they, were, they could come up with an intrauterine device that is much cheaper and much more available than the others that you can buy. Because in the United States, these cost between $450 to $850 each. Okay, it's a plastic this size, and and this one cost about a euro thirty or thirty five and something like that, and and it it is open, it circumvents intellectual property, it is much cheaper, it's much more available, and I was thinking, who are the women that would use this thing or need this thing, and uh, I was thinking if you if you are a woman and you are thirty, and you get accidentally pregnant, okay, you know, you can deal with it in a way. I mean, you, you understand the world around you. But if, if you are young, and if you are young in a place where you don't have um, uh, access to health insurance and so on, then maybe this could be a solution or a direction for a solution. So I published it, and, and it's called the Berina. I, I, I designed it to look, so to speak, appealing to young women, okay, with bare kind of, it's cute, yeah? Uh, my wife was like, Ronan, what are you doing in other women's vaginas? And I said, yeah, go do chairs. <laughs> and I said, look, Merav, I need to do this. This is, this is important. This is, this, is, this, is a, this is a statement about critical products in 3D printing that are open. I need to do this. I need to do this. And I, I produced a few. Uh, I, I photographed it, I put it in a, in a kind of a scenario that it looks real. It's kind of a, it's a, a, a generic pharmaceutical company presentation thing. And I published it. And things became kind of pretty weird because I started to get people, um, um, I, I got hate letters, I got, uh, it got published all over, and it was interesting for 3D printing places, for open source places, for policy places, about, you know, Obamacare and all that uh, issues, um, feminist uh, websites and so on and so on. It was a designer designs an IUD, a designer IUD kind of, it was, a, it, 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 it got into all kinds of things, in all kinds of situation. And I think up to now, this is my most uh, sharpest uh, uh, work. Um, and it's not a chair. And, and, this, and this year in Milano, there, it's going to be part of an exhibition. Now, I never, I never presented any of my furniture in Milano. And it's, it's just very strange that the first time I'm going to, to, to show something, it's this. Yeah, it's an it's a, it's a exhibition about uh, positive aspects of sex or something like that. It's strange. Um, I just, just as, as, a, as a kind of footnote to this, about a year later, Cody Wilson makes this uh, the Liberator uh, uh, gun, who makes, and he makes much more noise, you know, it's about uh, uh, will citizens produce their own weapons, will, uh, are, we, are we coming to an end of uh, armies and uh, establishments uh, holding the, the weapons and so on. Americans are pretty, um, they have uh, strong issues with, uh, with weapons, so, and, and, uh, it's, it, and it was a project about freedom of, of expression, actually. Cody Wilson is a lawyer, he's not a designer or a gun freak, and um, I think it's, it's, it's strange that my product, the Berina, was about not starting life, and his product was about ending life, and uh, I think when you go to the extremes, you, you begin to be a bit effective. You begin to, to, to make sense uh, in what can be kind of. It's, it's, it's also, I think it's a design fiction also. It, it's not, really, at this point, it's not really a product that any government should be afraid of it, apart from the, the notion that people can make weapons. I don't know, it's uh, in, in a, uh, it's, 
I mean, let's say weapons, the weapon factories and governments were so good at selling weapons to anybody who had money that this kind of thing is really not, not the effective way to, to circumvent it or anything. Anyway, this is a, a quote from the museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. They, they had to they wanted to show it in an exhibition, but Cody Wilson does not have an export license, so they had to download and print it, and they were feeling kind of weird because they don't have the original, but they don't have the concept of what is original and copy in context of, of open design, because there's no such thing as, as original and not original, but this is what they were saying. I teach also open design. Uh, this is from uh, Burg Giebichenstein in Halle, in Germany. And something very strange and fun happens when I introduce open design as an option to students. They begin to think uh, in, in a kind of a different way about their design, who they are, what do they want to express, what is their personal way of, of saying something, what are they about uh, in a way. And um, it, it takes about a few weeks, a month, until they kind of feel free to express themselves and not come to the professor and ask if it's okay or have a reason for something to be there or have kind of a, a linear uh, decision-making process and so on. They just, they just start to improvise, to have thoughts, to discuss it, to do it, to do it with others uh, together and so on. And, and, and I mean, you have here kind of a a pretty big range of just experiments. Let's do this, let's do that. It was, it was kind of a fun and very entertaining uh, semester in, in Halle. Uh, I'm not going to, I mean, this, this uh, shelving system by these two students over there was, they thought about uh, making a piece of furniture, a shelving system with no, with no um, end result. I mean, as w how you, however you put it together, it will become a shelving system, but there's no manual to do it. So it's not a, it's unthinkable in industrial design context, I think. Something about other people doing, or other, other fac uh, companies doing uh, open design. Uh, Jens David, you know him because he goes to all the fab labs in the world and does, and does version of this uh, chair, the layer chair. Um, WikiHouse is building, uh, you, you know them, I don't have, yeah, you know them, yeah, do this if you, okay. <laughs> WikiHouse uh, is starting to do, I would say, architecture, but small scale, uh, with um, CNC cut uh, wood panels. Uh, you can download the stuff from their uh, website and produce yourself or buy from them and so on. Uh, Fall School is, is quite a long time in the business. You can download the, the files to make uh, these cute children's tools. Um, Hedeco is, is, um, is a Polish company that you can buy <coughs> their stuff online, but at the same time you can download the plans and produce a piece yourself. And they're more complicated, they have electronics also, and uh, uh, intricate laser cutting and so on. They're, they're a bit, um, I mean, if, if I would, I, I cannot do this. I mean, I, I mean, somebody can, but it's, you need to, to want to do it. But they did it. Um, Greg Soul did the um, um, uh, kind of a software um, to make chairs. You draw it on a computer and there is a, a piece of software that produces the parts that when you cut them you can put them together in, in the form of a chairs and, and it actually uh, the, the, the variants are, are uh, endless. Um, at Fab, the, the quite new two architects from the uh, United States, I think Brooklyn, but I'm not sure, um, are doing right now a series of, of furniture that look something like that. Tables, chairs, stools, and so on, that are very simple and very straightforward to do with pieces of, uh, of, of um, plywood. And Open Structure by Jesse Howard, he did uh, like a whole range of home appliances that are motors, electric motors connected to 3D, uh, 3D printed parts and found objects or, or found products, shelf products like, like a, a bottle or a, a pipe and so on and so on. But, but it has, it's starting to get, I mean when you look at 
when you're starting to observe these as aesthetic expressions, you understand that they're something is shifting. It's not about doing something that is uh, beautiful or uh, makes you feel good as a consumer. It's, it, it's more about uh, pointing out to, to, um, to options that are opening when you go this way. You don't have to buy it. You just think about it. Yeah. Um, a failure. Why don't we talk a little about a failure? Of, uh, a few years back, uh, Druch, um, which is an um, extremely important Dutch design company, uh, very prominent in the 90s. I think I think uh, I, I'm still are is I'm still a very big fan of uh, Druch Design, and, and I think when they opened uh, the thing called Dutch Design in the 90s, it was an eye opener. I mean, they were extremely creative and uh, in a way successful and they, they wanted to do a project called downloadable design where they have this platform and they designed uh, not not Druch design but they gave designers to, uh, uh, a project to design um, furniture for this platform with other people that can go and like it, it should have been a big a big platform with a lot of furniture but it cost too much money and investor did, did not understand how it can work when you have a platform where you can download the, the plans and keep it and do whatever you want with them. And designers were very suspicious about what does it mean that I give my design, how will I make money with it. There was a lot of, of question asked and a lot of management that were forcing to do something and not enough money to to put it uh, kind of to go the whole the whole mile and just uh, publish it and, and do something like big with it and it failed and it was this 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 is from um, a Milano exhibition in 2010 or 11 and this, this is the ghost uh, of a platform and basically the, the, the whole project was extremely downsized and you cannot really download anything. There are configurators that you can configure this kind of, this type of uh, piece of furniture and cut it and so on, but it's, it, it didn't reach the, <coughs> the level of a functioning platform. And this is an example where traditional business comes to open uh, business style and they don't get along. There is a misunderstanding about how these things should grow. And from my opinion, things should grow organically, uh, much from, from bottom up. Take one designer, two designers, uh, three products, step by step. Uh, not big investments. Let people know, you know, gather what I, I call a community, like things that are happening in your fab lab and so on. It, it, can, it can reach much further and I think in, in less time and less money if you do it this way. Druch wanted a kind of a, uh, a hierarchy control situation of this going as a business and so on. It, it didn't work. It, it failed. But but others, at this time, um, did succeed. And, and, and more and more I started to see these things coming into our life. I think, I think the MakerBot, this is a hacker's MakerBot, kind of uh, customized, pimped up in a way. And this is the second uh, version of, of MakerBot. This, the MakerBot, I think it's one of two one of the two most important products in the beginning of the 21st century. Okay, the other one is probably an iPhone or an iPod. But this is comparable because 15 years ago it was not possible. This is an open product. It has open hardware, open software, open uh, uh, design. You can download, you can make uh, <coughs> improvements, you can join in, in, in a community. There is a Thingiverse, the platform that is connected this, to this kind of machine. Uh, in a very short time, it made a lot, of, a lot of people connected to it, made a very big community, very early on by early adopters, like, like, like makers. And the company was formed 2009, Brepetis and two others, I cannot remember their names, from Brooklyn. Um, at 2012, after selling 3,600 machines, they got uh, venture capital, they got $10 million to, to make the next step. And they made the next step, they closed it, first of all. It stopped being open. And Brepetis uh, uh, wrote a, a heartbreaking letter that he cannot see 
how uh, open hardware, open software, open design can integrate into the business environment that he is in now. And the, I think the community says, yeah, okay. But at that time, there were like maybe, I think, 20, um, 20 options of open 3D printers that you can use. So it was the, his contribution or the contrib contribution of that company or this machine was enormous. And six months ago, uh, MakerBot was bought by Stratasys for $418 million. And I asked myself, why did, why did Stratasys, which is one of the biggest producers of 3D printing machines in the United States, like it's, it's in NASDAQ and so on, what's worth $418 million? And, and, and my answer is the community, because the, the technology and uh, I mean, the, these machines are kind of, they're not the best, they're not unique, the patents are not really uh, with them, I mean, they don't own, own too much. They bought a community of makers and early adapters. This is what it's worth, 418 million. And it, it, makes, you, it makes you think, it makes you think. Uh, other things, um, I, I was talking about the aesthetics of it. You start to see the aesthetics of the maker. And makers are another breed of people that are, are producing and bringing another breed or a new breed of machines into our, of products into our world. They're not finished, they are, they, they work, um, they have this kind of a functional thing. They have this uh, um, unfinished, uh, uh, released in beta kind of. Um, uh, not a, no, it's not a consumer product. It's 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 like an experimental product within their community. And I started to to actually I started to like them, you know, because f I, I, as a designer, you're not used to uh, seeing these things or appreciating these things as a real design statement. But I started to look at it as a design statement. And you see more and more of them. I mean, you see like how, how makers make robotics. Um, um, it's, it's found parts together, improvised. Um, a lot of things three, four years ago were purple. Um, and when I was, doing, I was doing talks to makers, I was always asking, why? Why so much of your products are purple? I mean, when, as an industrial designer, to make something purple, it has to be like a very good reason to make something purple. I mean, if you, if you look at what is a purple product, I can think about dildos and that's it. You know, there's nothing like typical uh, purple. But they have, and they told me, when you buy the MakerBot, you get a free spindle, which is purple. And this is why all our products are purple. And I think purple is the color of the makers. You know, it, it, it's, uh, this is a uh, um, Raspberry Pi enclosures, yes? Um, and very straight to the point. Uh, very problem solving, very honest, very authentic. I like this, the authentic, the authentic uh, aspect of it. And I, I try to generalize the, the what, is, what makes a maker, what's the characteristics of a, of a maker product. And I'm thinking, yes, because they, they're not designers. They don't come from a, from, a, from a place where they have to communicate what they did. They just have to do it. It's a solution to something. It's something that does a job. And the job contains solutions to <coughs> where to put the, the, um, the Arduino board and the this and the inside and out and plugs and, and so on and so on. And it's very earnest and it's very straight and, and uh, it's very far from the ethos of what is an industrial design product. And I've, I've been doing, I mean, I've been doing a lot of talks about design, about makers, uh, with makers, workshops, and so on. I made a list. I made a kind of a comparison. What's the what's the difference? What I mean? Who is the designer tribe, and who are the maker tribe? What? How do they react? And how do they? What is their story? And um, it's two different tribes. And I think. Open design, in a way, can make them talk to each other. This is why I do uh, your, your design, your way, as a workshop. I think there is something there to connect, because the connection of these, if, if, I, if there is a, uh, just a little chance of connecting 
designers and making and makers together, each one's uh, knowledge and, and abilities and so on, it, it can become pretty powerful, I think, because it, they do so much, they do so much, I'm talking about makers, so much, so, so quick, uh, brilliant ideas, things that circumvent uh, uh, products that are in, are in the market, they're quick, they're open, I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about, and they're talking about transition, and this I, I find all the time. Um, since industrial design is a more traditional discipline, um, sustainability is uh, is a feature that you you hear in a lot of uh, design education places. This is like the 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 level of of correctness that a product uh, should have. But makers in in many places I meet are talking all, already about the transition. They're talking about. Uh, peak oil, about global weather change, about uh, not enough resources, about the collapse of uh, infrastructures, and they are getting themselves ready, seriously, for this transition. And to make this transition happen, they need they need to be uh, tool makers. They need to know how to write software for their tools. They need how to uh, make their tools functional in the real world where they, you don't have, you cannot go to a, to a shop and buy it, you just have to make it. And it goes down to education and they educate children on how to do this thing. And I find it extremely uh, valuable because, because I think industrial design education systems are completely missing the point in this, in this aspect and it's so important. Um, well, and just to, to kind of go down and finish uh, my talk in a, in a positive... Uh, now, this is my most blogged, published uh, uh, work ever. Uh, this is a few years back, I was shopping for a smartphone, and when you geek in tech blogs, you hear the word, you, the, the, you hear the word um, iPhone killer. Is the new LG 3X the iPhone killer? Yeah? And I was walking and saying, yeah, I, I know how to do an iPhone killer. It will be this, it will be a hammer that you can, in, a, in the shape of an iPhone. It's, it's a joke. It's a, it's, a, it's a product, a stupid product that comes out of the internet, appears itself uh, in the internet and is internet food, let's say, and disappears uh, as, as, it, as it came. It's like, a, it went viral. I had like uh, 30,000 entries to my website in like a day. I, it was published in every language possible. Uh, it, had, it was distorted in a way that uh, uh, a Norwegian website for online gaming told uh, its readers that you need to have a uh, level 60 warrior to have this kind of thing. A gay fashion website from Japan was talking about lavishly uh, um, carved mahogany handle. Actually, I went to Obi and bought it for three euros, this thing. Um, it, it had, uh, until today, because, because you, uh, this is also kind of a, Understanding, uh, uh, understanding an object that operates in a in a network culture. I mean, if you put your your product with with a with a tag iPhone killer, it appears on and on. I mean, it never stopped. And, 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 and every time there's something about iPhones or something about new phones, suddenly I get a, like a peak in my website. Suddenly people are looking at it again. And it's, it's a stupid product, but it, it's, I, 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 somebody calls me and says, I want two of these. I want to buy two of these. And uh, I said, yeah, no problem. Where should I send it? I sa he said, um, send it to this investment house in Seattle. And uh, it's a present for uh, Seattle, Washington. It's a present for a, a very important client we have who would, who would love to use it. So, and, and I sold two of these in, in kind of a lot of money comparatively to what it, was, what it cost me. And I think, I suspect, uh, I think maybe Bill Gates or, or Balmer got it. I suspect. I'm not sure. But uh, the guy was kind of, you know wh wh what I'm talking about, kind of. Yeah, so, <laughs> anyway. But um, that's about it. Tomorrow, before I, before I finish, I have a, I'm doing a two-day workshop and you're all uh, invited. It will be a fun thing. Uh, it will be about thinking, expressing, creativity, um, not necessarily functional. I, uh, you, you can produce it or not produce it. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, about, it's about open design, I guess. And, and uh, I, I mean, 
if you want, you are most welcome. And anyway, you can go to my website and check out my stuff. And if you want, you can download it and produce it and change it and do whatever you want with it. And, and that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Questions? Oh, everything was clear. Okay. So. Well, no, I, I, I think it was very interesting to hear in the sense that um, we are, I think here, we are architects and designers working, but we, we tend to be really close when it means to to fabrication, uh, to think in terms of engineering sometimes, no? So I think more, more or less like, I think everybody, it's, this opens the eyes to think like, again, that digital fabrication has a link to design, and so design is a cultural expression, so you can use digital fabrication as a cultural expression, or just, a, just as a problem solving engineering tool, let's say. But at the same time now, like as a question, like thinking that most of the people here, it's working on digital fabrication, probably more from this engineering point of view, so thinking on new geometries, thinking on new material, thinking on new tools. Like, um, do you have any ideas of how you can evolve or new, new ways you would like to explore digital fabrication concerning new materials or new CNC machines that will come out? Now you show, for example, CNC laser cutting, you're shown uh, 3D printing on plastic. I don't know if you have any ideas of products or how this thing could evolve once you, once machines for digital fabrication using different materials or different processes will be massively available. If, what, what's, what are your ideas in the case that these things will happen in a way? Um, I mean, we are, we are in a, definitely in, a, in the direction of, of uh, digital production of, of everything. Uh, it will come at this point or further point and my, our, a designer or architect is basically a person who is being created on, in, on a digital level to create something uh, physical in the real world. This is what it is about. I'm not in love with machines. I don't, I actually, I don't like machines. I mean, I, don't, I would not buy a 3D printer for my house. Okay? Although this is like the big thing, the, the third uh, industrial revolution. I, I don't buy it, especially when it comes from uh, companies that are uh, you know, uh, traded in NASDAQ. It, it cannot come. It's not, it's, not their, it's not their revolution. It's the maker's revolution, really, and, um, from my point of view. And more and more, as people become more proficient in doing um, digital objects or, or, or knowing how to handle <coughs> digital software to make products, uh, we'll see uh, the culture shifting to this direction. It's like what happened to music. It's what happened to in animation, to text, to it. This revolution is, 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 is progressing. Um, And I think open design is a good uh, prospect for that. I mean, it's a good situation to, to, to try it. And it's not against, I mean, I have to say something because you, maybe it was not, uh, not clear enough. Uh, my, open de my version of open design is not against mass production or uh, anything. It, it, it's, it's for something. Yeah? It's for creativity. It's for the, uh, being, uh, be, being able to, to handle transition and so on and so on. Um, a hundred years of industrial manufacturing of mass production uh, made industrial production perfect. The things you see in your world as, as mass production is perfect. There's just no, um, no reason to say you're not, you finish your, your, uh, your part in history, let's go forward. I would like to have a network with mass production and they have their own machines and they have their own techniques and their own uh, tradition and ethos and so on and so on. I think if it's in a, net, in a network it can happen. It can happen in a, a really innovative way. That's what I'm saying. Did I answer your question again? Okay. okay.
Um, my question is related to uh, your description of a maker. It's just a curiosity as um, the definition of disruptive to you. Because I saw that you put um, a designer versus a maker as a um, innovative for a designer and disruptive for a maker. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why do I say disruptive? I think um, when, you, when you are a maker and you are working with open hardware and open software, you create things uh, quick enough and functional enough to circumvent um, traditional ways of doing the same. I'll give you an example. Um, in 2011, when the tsunami hit Japan and the Fukushima Aichi um, power plant exploded, there was at the beginning only um, uh, readings of radioactivity from the government and makers bought a batch of uh, Geiger readers from Russia, put them with, uh, with whatever they put it, hardware, software, and made this box, uh, th there was a picture there but never mind, um, that you could just go around and it will monitor the radiation level and you would put it in a computer and it will upload the data and they they sold these for less than a hundred dollars while the normal one cost over five hundred dollars and after a very short time you had an independent uh, monitoring of the situation which was not exactly like the government okay so this is a disruption thing because usually on this kind of issue it was the government saying look we know how to do things please uh, believe us okay and since we lost our belief in in, in structures like uh, government and so on or, or NSA uh, disruption coming from um, from makers is a very viable possibility it's not the only thing and one of the the pictures there was uh, a DNA checking mechanism and DNA checking machine that usually you need like a university or like a biological facility to to check them because these uh, instruments are very um, professional and expensive but um, it was created somewhere in the United States by makers and biologists together and a, <coughs> and a 16 year old girl made um, research about the DNA of uh, fish that she ate in sushi places in New York and found out that a lot of them are using fish that are endangered species and are not allowed. Okay, so suddenly you have uh, um, facts that come out of a non-authoritarian non uh, structure. It's not from the government or from the health regulation and so on. It's something completely, this is a disruption. Okay, also, I mean, it's the first time in, in like forever that a normal person can produce a, a kind of a product after a product after a product uh, like he or she has access to a machine that actually produces something you're not used to that I mean you could have been a hobbyist or a hobby craftsman and so on but now uh, I mean think about the younger generation like the, all these 12, 15, 17 year olds that know how to, uh, they, are, they are DJs, they know graphic design, they do this, they do animation, they, now they also do products. I mean the, the cultural impact of this can be incredible. I see like in 5, 10 years, uh, like a group of kids from London that, that have their own fashion statements, completely, only, and because they took files from uh, Pakistani children uh, or, or culture or whatever, they, they pulled in from all kinds of resources like 3D information and, and created their own identity from it. They mashed up their thing and, and you know, like ska or like musical, like musical styles that came out of localized places. This thing can, can, can come up, up to, you know, uh, a whole product culture that comes from a local outlet. We're not used to that. This is disruption. Um, you talked about the gun, and I have a question. Uh, the gun, the gun, yeah. I have a question about this because um, do you think we have a responsibility with this, for example, when you reproduce an object, an object uh, not only is a symbol but also it's a functional object, and when you, you can reproduce it anywhere, in a, anyhow, it's like uh, 
making this action banal in a way. Um, so what do you think about this? Um, you mean a, a, a dangerous object? Yeah. Uh, but as I said, it, it's uh, weapons is a is a very interesting case because the. Um, it was always kept by commercial companies and governments. It was their territory. Suddenly it goes out. And, and uh, I think 3D printing or the digital revolution and so on, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Okay? It's not that I like this, this gun being like, let's print thousands of these and let's go kill people. And I think it's, uh, it's an expensive and slow way. And, and usually makers are not in this kind of business of Maybe there will be a maker hitman or something like that. It's an interesting proposition, but but uh, it's a double-edged sword. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. You know, uh, Cody Wilson's gun was an uh, exercise in freedom of expression. It was about me or him making a gun. A li he has a license to make guns. He has a license to produce, to sell, so on and so on. Um, and it created uh, a lot of a lot of trouble for him, and a lot of debate in the world about what is weapons, uh, who sells them, who buys them, and so on. And I think just by raising this uh, as an exercise of uh, freedom of expression, he he says every everybody can make a gun. Here is the situation. Now let's see how does it affect. Um, government regulation about guns. How does it uh, affect how people understand weapons as, as, uh, as uh, an object that has a potential to kill something, somebody, and it's even more available than it is uh, easily available right now. I mean, in the United States, you go into a shop and just buy a, you know, AK-47, you know. Uh, it creates a problem. It, 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 it pushes pressure points that are painful for, for a lot of uh, institutions and people and um, uh, situations and uh, society and so on. And this, it raises the subject. I mean, if I can do a, a weapon and you say, no, you cannot do a weapon, why me as a private person would not say, no, you cannot do a weapon? Okay, it, it, it creates a discussion between power sources within society to have some kind of resolution or try to go to some resolution about it. So it's not, it's not the, ob the object is, is, is not so important. I think the, the, the function of the gun, if it works more or less, if it breaks, if it's good, it's not good, it uh, shoots sharp and so on, it's not really important. The important thing is that it, it, uh, it, it makes um, an impact on the discussion of where are we going, how is the future going to look like with digital uh, production and internet and so on and so on. This is what it's, uh, the, if, if, if I would buy one of these, if I would print one of these, no, I don't care. I downloaded it from the Pirate Bay and, and did the, these things and uh, checked it out. I think it's, a, it's an interesting, ob I think it's very bad designed. Yeah? Um, looks like a edge of a window cleaner and whatever but it's not yeah a weapon should look like yeah and I think I think it's in, on purpose but this is what I did I answer your, your question thank you okay thanks it was a pleasure